Wonderful. We are all set. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Aparna Khandelwal, and I'm the advisor for energy and industry at the India Climate Collaborative. For those of you who are not so familiar with the India Climate Collaborative, let me tell you a little bit about us. The ICC, as we like to call ourselves, is the first ever collective initiated by Indian philanthropies, corporates, and think tanks to invest in the climate action for the country. We aim to increase philanthropic spending on climate solutions and to amplify the climate ecosystem by building the capacity of solution providers. With that quick intro, let's jump straight into our session. Now, decentralized renewable energy based agri solutions, both pre harvest like irrigation pumps, as well as post harvest like cold storages and agri processing, are critical for both building livelihood resilience and promoting green recovery. In addition to climate benefits, DRE based solutions, of course, facilitate enhanced energy access, further driving the economy and also create jobs, making it a win win for India's path to sustainable development. Now, while solutions aren't new, the market for DRE based agri solutions still hasn't achieved its potential in terms of scale, financing, innovation. Now, in terms of challenges faced by enterprises, a lot of them cite lack of proper financing channels, consumer affordability, consumer awareness, lack of benefits, um, and just lack of supply chain. The objective of today's session is to understand what are the suitable approaches required to achieve scale in the sector? How can we enable donors to play a more catalytic role instead of an incremental one and leverage the opportunity for impact, both in terms of avoiding GHG emissions and enhancing rural livelihoods? We have a stellar panel amongst us today, representing both the funders as well as implementers who have DRE-based solutions across the agri-value chain. Let me begin by first welcoming Himendra Mathur. Himendra is currently a venture partner with Bharat Innovation Fund. In a career spanning 25 years, he has invested in several early stage agri-tech and mid-sized companies working on innovation and value chain financing. Welcome, Himendra. I would also like to welcome Alok Varma. Alok is the project director at HCL Foundation, having played a key role in conceptualization and creation of Summer Foundation's flagship programs. He oversees strategy and management for HCL Samadai, a rural development program of the foundation. Welcome, Alok. I would also like to welcome Shambhavi Sharma, Shambhavi is a program manager at IKEA Foundation, where she currently manages multiple projects and partners in the renewable energy portfolio with a focus on innovation and grassroots organizations working in the productive use of energy space. Welcome, Shambhavi. Uh, we also have amongst us Karthik Wahi. Karthik is a serial entrepreneur having funded two ventures centered around uh, creating value for smallholder land farmers in India. His first venture, Claro Energy, provides innovative soil irrigation solutions for farmers. And his second, Claro Agro, is a farm to retailer agri commerce enterprise. Welcome, Karthik. We also have amongst us Devendra, the co founder of Ecozen and heads product management, strategy, and finance. Ecozen aims to improve perishables value chain and irrigation systems and has developed innovative solar powered cold storages. With that, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all our panelists. We are also expecting one more panelist, but we'll continue till she joins. Before we jump on to our discussion, a quick note for the audience. Uh, audience members can type their questions in the chat or Q&A box. And depending on time, we will take all the questions towards the end of the session. Great, so diving straight in, just to set the context, I actually want to know from both Karthik, you and Devendra, how do uh, DRE-based agri solutions contribute to building resilience of smallholder farmers and uh, you know how do they actually help increase their incomes so let me start with you Karthik, if you don't mind no no thank you aparna for a lovely introduction and uh, you know in some sense we've been a bit of a uh, we've been veterans in this space uh, can't call ourselves call ourselves a startup anymore i've been around for more than 11 years now uh, it's been quite a journey but uh, 
I think the story still stands strong in the sense that uh, you know BRE interventions across the chain uh, are uh, uh, definitely adding significant value. I can speak about uh, uh, solar irrigation, for instance. And in the 10 odd years, I think all the hypotheses that we started out with have only been proven right in the sense that uh, apart from the obvious diesel offset, uh, you know, for farmers who were earlier dependent on diesel based irrigation, uh, you know, solar irrigation, of course, is, is, is an immediate savings to them in terms of the money that they would save on diesel based irrigation. Invariably, the moment they have, you know, access to affordable uh, uh, and reliable irrigation in their own hands, uh, you would find that there's a change in the cropping pattern. Uh, farmers who would typically be doing one to two crops a year are likely to, you know, do intercropping and add one more crop, you know, the summer crop oftentimes, which, you know, translates again to additional income. Uh, you also see a change in the choices of crops that farmer would grow, right? You know, from traditional, uh, you know, staples, they would typically move up the value chain uh, and say that, okay, you know, we will find a lot of them moving towards fruits and vegetables, which fetch them a higher price in the market, but are definitely more water sensitive. Uh, so it, it's, it's a bit of a cascading effect that we've seen. So, you know, a lot of direct impact in terms of the diesel offset and a lot of indirect uh, impact in terms of, you know, all the other things that I just talked about. And all this additional income, you know, that really flows down to the bottom line of, of a farmer uh, spills over into additional spends into healthcare, you know, education of the family. So, I mean, I could go on and on, but, you know, I, I mean, fundamentally, we've seen that, you know, across all formats, uh, you know, whether we, we are selling a system to a farmer under a subsidy program, or we are, you know, our pay as you go service, or uh, a lease to own kind of a format. I mean, all of these benefits are, are, are you know, uh, pretty strong out there. Oh, wonderful for uh, actually... Uh, illustrating that so clearly and beautifully. Devendra, can I come to you with the innovative solar coal storages? How have you seen um, farmers kind of benefit? Okay, so great. I think Karthik uh, did cover my first bit. So, uh, um, with Audible, yeah, we also started with solar irrigation and uh, we saw that the farmers are actually moving on to more of fruits and vegetables. While their production has started increasing, we saw that their income is not increasing proportionally. And we realized that a lot of these perishable produce is kind of landlocked. So they are not able to go beyond a certain distance to sell this produce because if they try to go beyond certain distances, it would perish and uh, it would not really uh, get the value for them. So they are afraid to sell it too far off than their farms. So they tend to sell it to aggregators who come to their farms and they are kind of okay with whatever they are getting from the aggregator. So that is where we felt that, you know, uh, these guys have very limited options to sell their produce. And uh, if you're able to provide them access to coal supply chain, they would be able to take their produce to farther markets. They would be able to sell their produce at uh, the right time, at the right markets, the right buyer, to the right buyer as well. So that would give them better opportunity to get the right value for the produce that they are growing. So imagine like you run an industry, you run a factory, and you've produced uh, finished goods, and you're afraid that if you don't sell it by tomorrow, it will explode. So that is the kind of situation which we saw that the farmers were in. And we wanted to give them an insurance or a way to really uh, discover the right uh, options for them to sell. So from that particular perspective, we went on to build the cooling solution uh, we, we studied how things are happening in the West. We saw that in the West, the land sizes are pretty big. You have 50 hectares kind of land sizes and you get, you get, you deploy big size cooling systems near the farm. You have full size reefers that you can look at. Okay. Or you can, uh, freeze as well, grass freezes, multiple options are there. But when you bring down to the Indian agriculture, our land holding signs, um, you know, like one hectare. And the kind of solutions which uh, work over there in terms of economics won't be uh, going to work in our scenario, wherein we also have challenges with respect to energy access and so on. So from that perspective, we realized that we needed a decentralized approach to cooling. Um, we went ahead to build uh, the solar cooling solution, uh, say five tons. Now we're building two tons. We also have higher capacity. So depending upon whether it's a community model, an FPO using it or it's an individual farmer using it, Okay, uh, we went ahead to deploy those kind of solutions. And uh, what we have seen is that because of this inherently, uh, first of all, if you are having such kind of systems on your farm, 
inherently your price goes up because the buyers know that you are having good farm practices and that itself adds to your bottom line straight away and that is one second is that you are able you become more attractive for multiple buyers as well to come and work with you so we have seen fpos actually doing this and actually looking at selling to ninja cart and amazon and the likes of them in andhra pradesh who are our customers today so we have seen uh, improvement in uh, you know the livelihoods uh, we have seen that if we are deploying these kind of solutions too far from the farmers farms it's not going to work out because the whole process of loading and loading transportation is too inconvenient for them so it has to be near to their farms otherwise it doesn't make sense and uh, while we have done this we have seen that the farmers depending upon the commodity that they are growing have been able to you know benefit like on flowers they benefit 1 rupee per stick on uh, in case of say uh, certain perishable produce like coriander etc they can benefit up to 15 to 20 rupees per kg depending upon which market they are selling and so we have seen that by accessing better means for cooling um, better supply chain solution for perishable produce they can actually improve their livelihood uh, of course uh, similar to solar pumping and what karthik mentioned uh, we have also offered similar options like it's been available on subsidy fpos have got it on subsidy the uh, some of the farmers have got it on a lease basis uh, some of the farmers have taken the lease to own model okay and some of the folks have done it on a paper use model we have not done the paper use model ourselves but right. uh, i think uh, huda is there i think yeah. uh, so selco sure we'll has come, uh, we'll love to talk more about the models yeah. uh, a little the later but thank you for that and um, huda welcome to the session and i would put you straight on the spot uh, by requesting your views on you know how you've seen some of the dre based post process post harvest uh, processing solutions it really add value to the farmers and uh, help build a more resilient livelihood for them over to you Oh, thank you thanks so much aparna so sorry i got a bit delayed with had some internet issues but uh, it's great to be here thanks so much um so on the post harvest side so a lot of what we do is we basically map out where energy efficiency sustainable energy uh, green built environments play a role in catalyzing incomes uh, and removing drudgery within the different value chains uh, on the agriculture side so be it uh, rice be it spices be it uh, you know pulses be it horticulture of course post harvest thing is one of the largest areas where you can not only augment technology bring in mechanizations really decentralize uh, certain services and opportunities uh, towards towards closer towards uh, small and marginal farmers to closer to cooperatives but i think also you can see a significant income uh, increase opportunity uh, when you really work on the post harvest side um, so there are a lot of examples that we have seen uh, you know even combined even with cold storage units or uh, even sort of stand alone uh, where especially on the millet processing side on the fruit um, tomato and potato processing side uh, where post harvest processing units uh, whether it's with individual uh, farmers or with groups uh, as well as with cooperatives uh, you know the the unique thing about post harvest uh, processing is that it's no there's no one uh, machinery which works right it's really a gamut of different things starting from uh, you know right from your graders to your destoners to your you know range of different mills and then your uh, polishers and then your value addition uh technologies right whether you're baking uh, ragi cookies or you're you know making certain chaklis or so you're you're really your food processing comes into your post harvest right so it's a wide spectrum of technologies and uh, you know the the main critical thing is to really package those uh, solutions with appropriate finance uh, and to ensure that depending on the ability the capability as well as the aspiration of the enterprise or the cooperative they are able to actually have an option for uh, for you know for upward mobility and for actually creating better scale and better diversification uh, at the levels at which they are working um so i'll stop there aparna but happy to bring in more examples as we as sure. we get into the discussion thanks no thank you so much to that um we have two great donors in the room who've been very very active in the rural dri space in india and um, alok i would like to start with you and know more about the approach you've adopted for your dri programs in india and how you feel those interventions have positively impacted rural li livelihoods sure thanks aparna <clears throat> so definitely uh, at hcl uh, samudaya we have been uh, very focused upon 
developing and implementing a uh, decentralized uh, rural energy solution. In this context, we have set up over uh, 32 microgrids, uh, micro and mini grids, and we have uh, set up, uh, I think, Claro and Ecozen. We have worked bo with both of them uh, to set up agri pumps, to set up uh, uh, cold storage uh, chiller facility and uh, apart from that we have also very uh, been very focused upon uh, creating uh, these uh, solar solutions for uh, small scale farmers for uh, entrepreneurs uh, in this context we have uh, uh, powered uh, and uh, supported more than 35 uh, micro enterprises so far uh, including agri pumps, uh, agri processing units, uh, uh, some cold storage and chiller units, and uh, other things that can be done. So, from our perspective, what we see is there is definitely a need, uh, in so far as rural communities are concerned, and need emanates uh, basically from the factor a, a uh, the energy uh, situation, despite all the improvements in recent year continues to be unstable in rural areas, particularly if it is uh, uh, for uh, um, some sort of a livelihood activities. And uh, because that requires a continuous supply of electricity and a stable supply as well as uh, uh, surety uh, that it will be there when it is their productive phase. So that is one area where there is definite need. Secondly, the need emanates also from the fact that uh, despite all the coverage, uh, the, uh, co uh, the, uh, as far as economic activity is concerned, the coverage is uh, not 100% uh, from the, that perspective. So somebody wants to start up a, a small venture uh, in a rural areas, uh, it, they may not be connected. The village may be connected to electricity, but their location may not be connected. And agriculture is particularly a big example of that. And uh, so uh, we have seen and we have supported all these activities in different models. We're trying out different models uh, and that has been our approach. Uh, some of the challenges that we do see is uh, from the technology and its implementation point of view, most of the uh, uh, decentralized energy solution, uh, they are uh, uh, still uh, in the phase of development. Uh, more to say, some have still have the uh, basic hindrance of cost, like agriculture pump, for example. And as Devendra was saying, the land holding being so small, a single farmer is may not be able to afford that agriculture pump. So then we go into a model where we have to create a cooperative, and that uh, uh, creates a lot of uh, actually obstacles in implementing those solutions. Because if, if there is one farmer who can utilize the full uh, pump's capacity, uh, it's definitely much cheaper than the diesel and much more effective. But the land uh, uh, distribution being such that one farmer cannot utilize the full capacity and cannot bear the full cost of the agri pumps. So then we have to, as uh, Claro has uh, been trying with us, they, uh, to aggregate the farmers, develop the schedule. So that imposes a lot of work on the uh, technology provider and the, uh, like Claro or like Ecozen, that they have to aggregate their uh, customers into uh, some sort of an arrangement where there's a sharing of equipment to meet out the business model cost. So that is where I think that uh, as we go forward is some solutions can be developed which can be more effective uh, and scalable uh, definitely there is a lot of demand in rural areas for these kind of uh, DREs uh, we worked with uh, an agency where we are uh, doing a post harvest thing we're drying of vegetables and processing of that dried vegetables now that model is uh, very good because in the sense that uh, it uh, relies on stage one on uh, drying of vegetable through solar uh, heaters and in stage two it aggregates all the produce into a center where the entrepreneur can process using uh, 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 solar energy so we set up a 10 8 kilowatt plant for uh, processing center of these vegetables and it has been very successful that way because it can generate a lot of revenue because aggregation of 
lot of producers coming in so that is one thing that where uh, i think uh, livelihood gets very positively impacted uh, through availability of these dre solutions similarly uh, so i am saying seeing more in the uh, side of agro processing and agro allied processing where there is uh, capability of aggregating and achieving the scale uh, similarly we see in poultry uh, we uh, some of the poultry farms and dairy farms we supported through the solar uh, power again because of uh, possibilities of aggregation of produce uh, these were much more uh, economically viable solutions uh, because a lot of produce is coming in and that is it is getting produced uh, processed so that uh, revenue uh, uh, that is coming out uh, can effectively take care of all the expenses in setting up a solar plant uh, subsidies and those things do play a role but for farmers and small scale farmers to access those subsidies it's a, again a very hectic process so i think uh, from uh, funders point of view and from developers point of view our approach is slightly veering towards the solution which are uh, the post harvest category uh, both for agri and agri allied uh, things because the aggregation of produce is uh, something that gives uh, much more scalability in terms of in deploying those solution uh, apart from that i think uh, Uh, definitely there is a need and that need is being uh, served uh, through uh, these dres and we have uh, as i was saying we have set up more than if you take all the plants in question apart from 32 mini grids that we have set up we have set up uh, nearly close to uh, 100 solar plants in a very concentrated area uh, ranging from a capacity of 1 kilowatt to 65 kilowatt so uh, and uh, the mini grids that we have set up even that solar power lot of people are uh, very keen on utilizing that to run their enterprises it may be a pulverizer atta chakki uh, again there again uh, some technological requirements uh, need to be developed because the equipments that they use are may not be that energy and efficient so that transition is slightly costlier at this moment from transitioning from the equipment that normally people use to a solar or a energy based uh, 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 solutions so that is where slightly i think the progress need to be done otherwise i think yeah. it's definitely there is a lot of scope and we have seen a lot of success in creating livelihoods i think when our the plant that i was talking about the dry drying of vegetables more than uh, 100 women are linked to it and earning uh, nearly 2000 to 2500 per month so that's where i think it's definitely a lot of scope is there and i think uh, regulation apart the scale and economy has to focus more on the post harvest side for aggregation purposes great no thank you so much alok for covering the entire gamut of both the solutions um really heartening to know that your projects have been so uh, well conceived and uh, well received as well and um, i know you have to rush for an engagement would love to have you till the end of the session but thank yeah. you so much uh, for making it here um thank and you. i would thank now you. like to uh, move on to shambhavi uh, shambhavi ikea has been doing some uh, great on ground work in the dre productive use space especially focused on the agri value chain would love to hear some of your thoughts on how you feel your programs have been able to create a differentiated approach to the space sure uh, thank you aparna it's an absolute pleasure to be with all of you in this virtual room today which i really hope changes into an actual physical space sometime soon um but anyway uh, before i talk about the approach to dre programming um i would like to take a step back and sort of explain the contours of our work at IKEA Foundation a bit so that it sets the the context uh but just very briefly um at IKEA Foundation we put all our energy resources time uh, and effort into tackling um the two largest threats to a more prosperous future for the many people uh climate change and poverty and we all know the magnitude of the problem so i'm not going to get into um the data and semantics and stuff but um so our programming um really focuses on creating sustainable livelihoods um within planetary boundaries and dre literally sits at the nexus so it's it's really going to help us reach the many people the most vulnerable farmers entrepreneurs producer groups 
and um, you know when when DRE is combined with efficient technology, um, appropriate um, finance and market linkages, um, it really really can transform lives. And um, so so DRE basically um, in all our programming should ultimately lead to an increase in income, and um, therefore it's safe to say that we work on productive views of renewable energy. Um, and when I think um, when when I when we talk about our approach to DRE programming in India and elsewhere, um, I think it's it's fairly simple, and it's primarily an amalgamation of the the people and the partners we've met and worked with over the years and sort of learned from. And I think uh, the Selco Foundation uh, merits a special mention here because we absorbed uh, a lot of their learnings and, and experience in the field and sort of uh, wove that into our strategy. And I'm absolutely not saying this because Huda is on the panel as well, but um, and a lot of other partners, of course. Okay, so um, coming to our approach, um, we firmly believe that any meaningful change um, starts with and includes those who need it the most. Um, so, for example, small family businesses, farmers, entrepreneurs, they are really, really working hard to make a living and solving a lot of prob problems that we know very little about. So we constantly ask ourselves, um, you know, is, is this going to solve their problem? Um, is, is this really what we want to do? Um, so we basically focus on, you know, it's, it's how do I put it? We're very end user centric. It's a trait that we have inherited from IKEA business and a trait I think is desperately needed in the, in the DRE sector these days. Um, so our focus is um, end user centric. Then we try to see how energy can sort of catalyze change. So if, if manual labor is dominant, what is the appropriate um, solar plus efficient appliance that can be deployed to sort of end drudgery? Um, does this pure technology offer a better price uh, performance mix than what they're used to, which is also called as the democratic design at IKEA, um, which is a very different approach from product pushing or pushing a technology without really looking at the needs and the, the demands. Um, are the upfront costs high? Um, if they are high, um, how can they potentially um, receive loan, for example? Are the financial mechanisms in place or um, how can they best be linked to the right market, uh, market uh, linkages, basically? Or, um, you know, how can we sensitize others? Is there enough awareness? Is there infrastructure? Um, do we have supporting policies, um, training and capacity building for operational efficiency? So each solution that we offer is a different set of or rather a melange of social, technical and financial interventions um, based on the needs of the people that we are working with and for. And it's important to note here that all these interventions do not have to be through the same organization. So we really, at the foundation, we really promote synergy. And it's high time we stop working in silos and sort of look at working together to make a dent. Um, so basically, the emphasis is not on um, hardcore research and development, but it's rather a mix of innovations to serve the rural poor, starting with energy needs. And we've got a lot of examples um, and we've been in this space for about four years now and Selco has been with us since the very beginning. So a lot of our um, impact stories are from Selco, um, which of course Huda can chime in, um, but I'll very briefly touch a, uh, on a couple of them and then one from the Mlinda Foundation as well. But um, there was this. So maybe, uh, uh, you know, we have the second part of the conversation for mm -hmm. the, you know, oh, the perfect, scale perfect. Aspect. So I'll come back to you on that one. Cool, sure. Yeah, sure. Great. No, thank you so much. Imendra, I do want to come to you now. You've heard the implementers, you've heard the donors, and you're the only one with the private capital in the room today. So, how do you feel? You know, DRE uh, solution market is still a very niche one, it's still small. Um, and how do you feel these, uh, you know, we've, the donors told us about some of the great programs they're doing. How do they enable uh, private capital to come in? Thanks, Aparna. And thanks to all the panelists for some very wonderful views. You guys are doing a tremendous job, I must say. It's a lot of heavy lifting in, in this space. And I think if you have to make it success, we have to work together. So to your question, uh, Aparna, clearly, I think in terms of need for the solution, I think it, it's right there, you know, and I'm, I'm saying that, you know, it's gone other days when we were measuring our agricultural productivity in terms of tons per hectare, we should move it to tons per liter of water and tons per unit of energy consumed because fortunately we have enough land, but 
we have little water left and of course energy is becoming an issue right so so i think that's the paradigm shift that we need to bring in in the mindset not just at the policy level but also at the practitioner level and finally to the farmer right so i think that's that's how i see this uh, you know things changing as as we see more and more stress coming out of climate risk and stuff stuff like that and now the question on financing i think it's a very valid point uh, you know how do we uh, build capital for these solutions so if you ask me private capital very frankly it's still not the space where you know venture capital would come and you know put a 50 million dollar check you know of course we have great entrepreneurs and with all due respect the fundraising has been a challenge uh, in this space um, and for that to happen i believe one way to is to look at re-engineering business models right and and if you look at any asset based model uh, you know how do we convert that into a model which can demonstrate scale unfortunately a lot of assets that are being created be it cold rooms be it solar water irrigation pumps or be it uh, bulk milk coolers you know it's been a growth story but a linear growth story you know how to change the curve from linear to non linear you know if you want to attract private capital and that's where i see that you know these models have to be reengineered and whether we like it or not in agriculture space in particular i think the market linkage is the key anchor if you want farmer to adopt a solution if you want farmer to invest into a solution you have to tell him guys you do this and i'll buy it for you or i'll make sure someone buys from you you so that's the hard reality not just for the kind of solutions we're talking even someone who's providing data and advisory services to farmer he said fine i'll pay for it but what does it mean for me right so i think that equation need to be set and that's where the market linkage becomes extremely critical uh, and that's why you know of course we are seeing ecos and launching ecotron and i'm sure eco connect sorry and likewise i believe um, claro is also doing something in this space uh, so i think that's that's one area which i see can make an impact in terms of creating uh, opportunity for private capital i can give you one more example of company called s4s technologies where i am on the board uh, and we have very similar we had very similar situation we were giving dehydrators solar conduction dehydrators to farmers and uh, you know asking them to you know instead of selling fresh produce sell the dehydrated one but the question came who who will buy it so essentially we invested into the whole supply chain uh, the primary processing was done at the at the village level uh, mostly by women farmers and they earned like 100 rupees a day which is quite significant for them and then we built a secondary processing unit which essentially converted those products into products which is needed in the market so essentially we are selling to synthite and uh, americo and an sla so so we ultimately built the entire value chain so there's enough offtake and as a, as a, as, a, as i speak today we have almost 500 micro entrepreneurs who are using these uh, dehydrators now and and we are supplying the pr uh, primary produce and we are buying almost on a daily or biweekly basis and that's what created scale and attracted capital right so i think that's that's the mantra that i have uh, uh, that you know how do we build uh, 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 it uh, as an attractive model for for a private capital having said that there is also opportunity for catalytic financing blended financing uh, and we have seen for any model which is relatively new of course this is not new but we are the risk perception is relatively higher blended finish does do a good job in doing some bit of heavy lifting and building capacity so that could be another way to look at it wonderful thank you himendra and with that you've already actually touched upon some of the uh, the next phase of this conversation uh, and i'll go back to kartik and devendra um, Alok and Himendra have already touched upon, you know, some of the aspects as has Shambhavi in terms of how do we look at scale and what are the, some of the challenges. Now, Karthik, especially in the solar irrigation pump space, I mean, uh, it's a very government driven market, so to say. Uh, and uh, while the contracts are going on, what are, what are the challenges as per you for this market in uh, the near future? and how would do you think innovation is likely to come about right. so no, before and before answering that question aparna i just like to make a comment about what himendra and even alok mentioned in you know, funnily enough even our uh, sort of you know, drive to you know set up robot setting up uh, you know 
at least experimenting with something on the forward linkage side came from the fact that you know solar irrigation alone uh, wasn't ensuring prosperity for the farmers in the sense that you know what value was being created but not being captured often times you deliver savings in terms of diesel or helping the farmer grow better you know uh, higher value crops but he would still end up not fetching the price or or often times even kind of you know liquidating his entire produce for demand supply shocks or even inability to you know hold the inventory you know in a cold storage or whatever what have you and even though our our forward linkage intervention is not dre enabled in the sense it's not a cold room or something you're just trying to remove middlemen uh but the but the philosophy was very simple that you know the value that is being created on uh, the input side this is you know we are for the irrigation can potentially be captured by ensuring that at least they get market price or you know slightly above market price if possible um so completely echo that sentiment that you know forward linkage is an important ingredient it can't be overlooked you can't singularly try and solve just one part of the problem uh, because the farmer is going to question that you know okay i'll take your irrigation pump but what guarantee does it have for me in terms of you know ensuring that okay i still i mean for him it's a it's a it's a very fundamental question that he has to answer so blending something which is addresses that part of the problem also is a very critical element uh, coming to your you know question so you know as in some sense veterans in this space i i feel that you know subsidies have been both good and bad uh of course they you know uh, they've kind of stimulated the the ecosystem in some sense and you know uh given us, you know, the likes of us enough business and top line and the bottom line uh, but you know it has also uh, very honestly stifled innovation i mean i must admit that uh, and you know what happens is that you know innovation comes from two things one either you know business becomes a bit of a rocket ship and is in a sector which is taking off in a, in ways beyond your imagination and you really start kind of you know working at truly solving the problem or you have someone who's willing to back you as an as an entrepreneur a funder who's willing to back an entrepreneur such as yourself and saying that hey i am going to fund you for a certain period and you know you don't worry about you know how you will run the house you know the the engines will keep running and you will obviously your opportunity cost will be taken care of and often times you know uh, you know as a as a founder you know one gets dissuaded because you know you at the end of the day you know we all in it to uh while while yes of course deliver impact but also make this work our time uh very bluntly put right i mean uh and the opportunity cost starts getting at you and uh, invariably when i know that i can you know with similar effort if i can get 100 crores of top line you know with a healthy you know 7 8% pat margin uh you know via subsidy program uh and then there is this other path of you know trying to unlock value for a farmer under the pay as you go service which is extreme not attracting the right kind of capital uh talent uh even as you said you know i mean as i think alok alok mentioned aggregation of end users is challenging so it's return on effort uh, and the ecosystem support is completely kind of you know out of sync uh, uh which is why i feel that you know uh, subsidies uh, in some sense have given us a shot in the arm in terms of giving us a chance to stand as an organization but at the same time there's cycle innovation uh how does one address that it's a tricky question to answer uh, quite simply because you know venture investing works in a in funny ways yeah beyond you know what most of us was imagine i'm hoping at some point in time you know uh, dre can also become the flavor of the season as have, as have lots of sectors uh, in the past which have maybe fundamentally not had the promise but you know with the right kind of you know venture investments actually delivered you know rich dividends uh, in the space uh, and we have tons of examples i will not name many but i'm sure we we're all aware of all of those uh, and i i can't even you know say that i mean you know i can't we can't wish away the subsidies we can't wish that you know we see you know take this sector more seriously and start putting in money uh grant capital definitely takes us some distance uh, but as i said you know they are, i'm sure it's patient capital it works very well for us uh, but you know un- unless you you're doing a pilot which really translates to something very meaningful you know gives you the right kind of traction which can subsequently unlock the, the secondary capital that you're looking for a pilot just ends up being a pilot Uh, and that's the hard reality right i mean i think the the ultimate goal for every pilot is to become a self sustaining initiative which can you know attract mainstream capital uh, of all kinds uh that said funny enough i think dre has uh, you know unlocked i i would say a uh, tons of capital but of a very different kind working capital for sure uh, project financing for sure but you know again all of that capital pushes you in a completely different direction which is nowhere close to innovation in some sense uh, if i may say so. 
Yeah. But maybe no, Devendra can allude more to it. I, I, I would go to Devendra and thank you so much for being so honest about it, Karthik. Devendra, I'm also cognizant of time and I do want to bring in all the other panelists uh, one more time. So very quickly, we've heard market aggregation, we've heard uh, forward linkages. Um, but what's that if there is any holy grail to scale uh, that you would like to achieve? So I think uh, what we see in Africa with respect to TRE is something actually uh, very good. Uh, him and there are $50 million checks being written down in Africa. I think all the small lighting companies, they have raised crazy amount of capital and they are running on a pay-per-use model in those markets. I think the way the subsidy has hindered in India is that we couldn't really bring in those models. So I think uh, one way which I think is that if you're able to still have a pay-per-go model in India and uh, it can be funded with debt uh, with some kind of grant capital and some kind of private capital okay that could be a way to actually scale this model in india because in india because of the subsidy people are used to free things okay so it needs to be a bit more competitive while in africa people are willing to pay like crazy amount of money uh, in india you would see like one fifth of the appetite so i think that is one area which i feel uh, could be looked at to scale this i think uh, Apart from that, I see that uh, even though, you know, like these assets are uh, there with the digitization coming in place, you can drive better utilization to get better ROIs uh, from these uh, equipment. So say when I look at a solar pump or a solar cold room, a farmer tends to use it for say three to six months in a year. So if somebody else can have a use for that during the other part of the time and can be utilized, uh, we can type the utilization, then your IRRs improve a little, which is possible because of digitization coming in place right now. So I think uh, these are broadly my two cents, apart from what Hemendra, Alok, and Karthik have already covered. Great. Thank you. Puda, very quickly moving on to you. You've worked across the spectrum and across different models. And therefore, I do want to bring you in and get your perspective on scale. What is it that's required now? Sure. Thanks so much, Aparna. Just to touch upon a little bit of what uh, Shambhavi also mentioned, Himendraji also mentioned, uh, you know, one is I think Shambhavi spoke a lot about synergy and Himendraji was also plugging in a lot on that in terms of if you don't have your necessary input and your market forward and backward linkages, a lot of these really kind of fall through, right? Because that's where your value addition really comes in. Uh, and there are multiple examples of that. So a lot of what we do is really partner and work with entities and organizations that are that are strong on these aspects, right? So say, for example, Lakshya Kalpa is an entity, it's, it's, a, it's an enterprise that basically does value-added value organic milk, right? Now, when, when someone like a Selco works with them, we are able to really plug in the necessary mechanizations on-farm, off-farm mechanizations, diversification and energy gap because they have a very sound market linkage aggregation already in place and happening, right? Similarly, when we capture a case where we capture so much of income increase on a spice processing unit, it's very important to capture the costs that went in before that intervention as well as after that intervention, right? On the monitoring, the aggregation, the input, the packaging, all of those, the branding, all of those. And the cost of really mobilizing, uh, you know, a corporate, a co uh, making them a cooperative, you know, linking them to finance, doing all of that aggregation those costs somewhere get left out when we capture these cases right of income increase and, and there's so many really good example whether it's Vasan in Odisha and the Olet, uh, Odisha Millet Mission where they're really buying back all of the produce that SHGs and SPOs are doing on Millet uh, and putting it into the PDS system working closely with the government right now that's a great example of commitment to market and how do you then plug in the mechanization and drudgery removal gap right uh, and so you know working I think with stakeholders like that and really forming strong partnerships can help us go uh, sort of multiple levels on the adoption impact and then scale. Because I think it's important to not have assets which are lying unused and underutilized, uh, most critical. I think we can achieve scale. I, I can think of so many examples where, you know, subsidies have gone in and we put in 20, 
50 units, but the thought of where should it be placed, who should own it, what should the business model be, who will put in the costs of running it uh, to make sure that it at least operationally break even. Now, all of those aspects are your pre and post costs, uh, right? Which, which, which actually I think, so you mentioned what is the kind of silver bullet that I see. I think one is last mile entities and their ability to actually design value addition for, you know, DRE led uh, productive use uh, ent uh, packages, right? Because it's always, even if you go in with one technology, you know, the transaction cost is too high. You might as well package it with multi technologies. Like I was giving you the example of Akshay Kalpa and the milk value chain. Right from hydroponics to milk chillers to milking machines to shaft cutters to pressure pumps, you know, you can have so many options which can be better packaged for much more like better income and impact today, right? Um, so one is sort of, you know, the ability of last mile entities to really do these uh, do these value proposition, these sales, these business models at a grassroots level. And this, I think if we multiply those, we can get much better scale much faster, right? And the second thing is really designing programs in a manner which are covering your pre and post costs. So complementary programs where, you know, funders are coming in and saying that energy is this catalyst and one piece, but who is funding the market linkages, who is doing the, you know, post linkages, etc. So I feel these two things if we're able to you know do at a faster pace and a scale and in a better manner we can really get to a uh, much better impact uh, sooner so I, I, there are more examples about the yeah, no. center. great no thank you so much and shambhavi i do want to bring you in and uh, would love for you to share some of the experience that uh, you know ikea has had while deploying these different models whether through fpos and you know looking at these different the range of dre solutions in the agri space and just what your experience has been and uh, yeah any commentary on if you think the role of donors is going to change as we go forward sure i would like to add the perspectives of um, of donors when it comes to scaling especially uh, most of the points have been covered but um, like huda mentioned working with strong regional grassroots organizations i think is key for sustainability um, replication as well as scaling um, I mean, um, you know, local ownership, know-how, local presence, um, homegrown solutions really lead to uh, a much more uh, concrete contextualization of processes. But it's slightly difficult for donors like us to reach them directly. And that is why we work with organize, uh, with, with Celcos and the Tara Trusts to basically um, reach the, the actual organizations in the field and sort of build their capacity on the way as well so that they become the Celcos of the future. Um, I think um, replication of a process is the best way to scale. Um, so you start with the end user, sort of make um, a, a solution that works for them. And, you know, there is tremendous value in, in demonstration, particularly when it sort of generates um, um, data about the performance of a particular pure asset, because we won't be able to generate capital um, for financing assets if we don't have performance data, right? Um, and, and, you know, scale comes from, from financial institutions because then um, they don't fund just one um, farmer, but multiple of them. And then I think uh, as donors uh, to achieve scale, um, we must play a critical role in, in sort of influencing strategies of others, which includes other donors, um, investors, providers, to sort of replicate its successes across different customers and markets. And, and sort of learn from the failures and, and avoid repeating them. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, because I've, I've mentioned that again, it's very important for all of us to work together, ditch the, the silo mentality and sort of look at our experiences and work together. And I think our commitment to scaling DRE reflects in our recent $1 billion initiative with Rockefeller Foundation, which is the single largest DRE initiative um, aiming to avoid 1 billion ton of greenhouse gas emissions and um, improve 1 billion lives by basically focusing on post-pandemic economic recovery and um, empowering emerging economies to advance to renewable energy. And, and the platform is basically going to be an efficient and safe way to scale up and speed up the transition to DRE. Um, so yeah, I think, um, and, and sorry, one important thing that I just realized is, or that I just learned is actually the, the quality of products. Um, we don't really look at quality standards of, of different pure appliances, um, which adds on to the, the risks that financial institutions already have. And therefore, there is not too much of lending. And I think we really should focus on 
uh, the quality products and standards of productive use appliances as well with Verasol or, or CLAT sort, sort of organizations. Wonderful. No, thank you so much, Ambibi. And um, I'm sure we are all excited about the one billion fund and we really hope it's able to uh, bring the scale to the DRE space that it's been awaiting for all these years. I'm very cognizant of time. We have five minutes left and we also have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so I'll try and take as many as I can. And uh, maybe, Hemendra, this one's for you, uh, bringing in the uh, private capital perspective. There's been a question, how much of a challenge has been the loss of economies of scale and its impact on financial viability when you take solutions to a decentralized sta scale, stage? So, you know, how do you uh, compare more centralized cold storages, large uh, processing units to a much more decentralized level? How does the financial viability get impacted? Absolutely. I think it, 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 it I would say it's positively gets impacted as Devendra was saying, you know, we are into a one hectare agriculture economy. So if land is decentralized, how assets can be centralized, right? We have centralized mandis, we have centralized processing and that doesn't work. You know, they operate like most SMEs that I know, wheat milling, flour milling, spices uh, processing, they operate at 40-50% capacity which kills the economics. And so I'm a firm believer that it has to become more and more de decentralized. And, and to Devin's point, I think he made a very important point, this role of digital tech. You know, I think digital tech and hard tech is a deadly combination. We need to figure out what is the right trade-off and what is the right mix. And where the digital tech drives scale, hard tech drives margins, right? So I think we need to get that combination right. And you will see a lot of decentralization, not just in DRE, but in warehousing, in processing we are already seeing some examples of it and it is going to improve the efficiency and of course there are multiplier effect in terms of employment generation farm economics etc etc great thank you and we have one more quite a hard hitting one with rapid electrification and quality issues presumably being eradicated going ahead how do you see the scope of dre in future amidst a subsidized agri economy i'm not sure which one of my panelists would like to take this one Thanks. Huda, please go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Uh, absolutely not a hard hitting question at all. I think we've been asked this question for the past 25 years, literally. Like, I know that every year, you know, what are you going to do? You know, electrification is improving. But I think it's been a while since we've gotten away from the whole on grade, off grade, uh, you know, debate because it's really not about, uh, you know, whether, whether the grid comes in or DRE comes in. I think the fact is, irrespective of the grid in many ways DRE is the future right I mean you see this happening in many countries be it Germany be it Spain you know they they went through that whole thing but irrespective of how strong the centralized grid gets you know just think about the centralized grid technology right you just think about your transmission lines your distribution lines your losses I mean how long do we do we keep you know harping on that same right so irrespective of its liability of its thing i think a lot of people and the highest sales for solar really happens in the most electrified areas for dre so i feel like you know it's more it's more about the narrative needs to shift to how do you get more people off grid not on grid you know because that is really more from a future perspective so i think we tend to stay away from the the narrative of uh, of electrification for sure Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, with that, I know we have more questions, but we are also coming towards the end of our allocated 55 minutes. So first of all, thank you to all my panelists for those great insights. And to sum up, I think uh, in a sense, what we are hearing is we do require an ecosystem based approach with multiple levers playing together, you know, whether it's uh, deep tech, agri tech, hard tech, business modeling, uh, various kinds of financing. Uh, we didn't get a, t a chance to delve deeper into it, but Hemindra did mention, you know, catalytic financing, models of blended finance, and not to forget aggregation as well as market connect, how we need to really work upon all these levers together. And then hopefully that will be the holy grail to scale in the DRE based solutions market. With that, I would once again like to thank all my panelists as well as our audience for joining us today. And I think kudos to all of us for finishing the session bang on time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.